stalactites. Small ones. Um, So one problem that can happen, and it's happened here, is that if this background area is too distant in color than these shadows, these will look like carrots <laughs> hanging from the top edge, instead of feeling like shadows in that forest. So if there's too much of a jump between those, then our eye looks at that, and it doesn't hold those as, as, as separate elements. So instead, um, if I have those closer together, then all of a sudden that starts to meld together as more of a unified forest. So be aware of too much of a sort of jump. But this, this trick allows me to create areas of deep forest very, very, very quickly. And gets me out of that, I'm going to draw a tree next to a tree next to a tree next to a tree. I get a sense of treeness, but I don't have to draw 50 million trees. So once I've got that, here's a little bit of foreground. In the foreground, I put a little bit of grounding underneath some of these bushes to hold them in place like we did with those rocks. Um, I've popped a few holes into this foreground tree so you can see through it in a few places. Um, but kept these foreground plants light so that they stand out against those backgrounds. And I very quickly get a sense of, oh, I'm looking at a zone of forest. And so I'm playing with the shape of that top edge. I'm playing with um, these foreground trees again. I, was, I went around that tree shape. I wasn't drawing the tree. I was drawing the boundary around the tree. So that's why when I put the dark in behind it, what I'm left with is that that boundary line gets absorbed visually into the background, and what it, the tree is, is the inside core part. And that tree's in the back. So it's a very fast way of handling forest. Kind of fun? Um, so there are some general principles of, of drawing here that can be applied not just to, to forest drawing, but to drawing really anything. Our brain knows that this forest is made up of a whole bunch of trees. And so what we want to do is deconstruct that and draw the, the separate parts. But if you can back up from it and draw the mass, where you see the lights, where you see the dark sand, that makes it a lot easier to actually get a representation of what you see. Are there any forest drawing questions? Or can, I know this, it's a different story for oak woodlands. But, um, yes? Was all of that done actually with the same pencil? Yeah. Because some of it looks like a technique and a softer pencil than this part back here? No. So this background, I'm just pressing more lightly with it. A couple of notes about, things to notice about the background is I, so on my background, I first put in a bunch of Pale vertical lines. Got a sort of sense of like those background mm -hmm. trees. Very pale. Sort of close enough together. And as I would come down, I would get softer towards this edge. Um, and what that did is it created 
this sort of potential area of, you know, other sort of willowy vegetation in there. I popped this shadow in underneath that. The first one was just like that. So those are the lines that I came down with. And then I put that in, and all of a sudden, like, oh, those have a place to land. Right, they stop there. Um, you can see a few of those downward facing Vs in that background, but again, I don't want them to be symmetrical, and I want them to be close enough in value that they don't become carrots. Another thing to notice is that as I was doing these, I was coming along, putting my shading in here, and I absorbed these two trees. And I thought, like, I actually want my trees to sh stand out a little bit more. You see how these two trees really start to blend in? I'm losing them. So here they were before. They were a lot happier. They're like, oh, I'm a tree. Right? And then we get all this other red behind them, and we start to lose them. Oh, that's a shame. So as I, I, I destroyed those two trees, and so I thought, okay, as I'm coming over here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, as I get closer to this tree line, I'm going to get even more pale to let these things stand out a little bit more so that I wouldn't lose all those. So I, 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 I learned that partway through, like, oh, I want to save those trees. And of that effect. Also notice that because these pencil strokes in here were originally made horizontally, that those places where, you know, if we just kind of back it up to here, you can see that this is just sort of scrubbing back and forth. But by the time it gets in here, right, you feel like, oh, you're intentionally leaving this little shelf for where the you're showing this light sort of shelf of foliage, this sort of mass of leaves coming up. No, that wasn't intentional. That was just an accident. It comes with having these be horizontal and then blocking these things out with my downward facing piece. <clears throat> uh, what pencil do you use? Maybe you already mentioned it. So, so this one, this drawing here was done with a Prisma Vera Thin pencil I think called Tuscan Red. What's it called? Prism? A Prisma Color Vera Thin. It is a, it's a colored pencil that keeps its tip. It doesn't lay down as much sort of saturated color as normal Prisma Color pencils. Prisma Color pencils are a brand of sort of good quality colored pencils. Um, their uh, line of pencils called the Verathins keep a sharper tip, but they don't put down as much sort of dense, saturated color. And so I'll sometimes do a little sketch. Here I could have done this just with a graphite pencil, but um, I like every once in a while, you know, pull out my little red pencil. <laughs> so I drew trees with a red pencil. Um, this is what forests look like on Mars. <laughs> Other questions? Let's take a look at one more little demo. All right. Um, so here you are. There's a forest in front of you. And what I've done is I've already done the part where I have drawn in carefully the shape of those background trees. Let's see if I can get this a little bit more in focus. So being careful not to get them too symmetrical. And put in the foreground some working around the outside edge of, and I'm outlining these trees. They're going to be light against the stark. That's going to be light against the stark. So rather than these little tips kind of where I'm actually drawing the little tree coming out. Now I'm going to put just value into those areas. So fill them with a, an area of tone. Again, with horizontal marks in here and vertical marks in here, even more pale vertical marks in there. You kind of get the sense here that you're looking at with these vertical marks, it's sort of maybe an indication of that you're seeing trees. Right? And over here, it's you might be seeing horizontal clumps of branches. And then I'm going to do the same thing. So I'm, and look at how these trees in the foreground are then popping out. Right? But again, those are, I've worked around the outside edge of those. So that, that tree still has a skinny little top coming out. If I had drawn it in this way, it wouldn't have that. So I've drawn around the outside edge of those guys. Now I'm going to hang those 
I hopefully not carrots, those downward facing bees. <laughs> I'm going to go planting carrots across this picture. And pow, there's depth in that forest. And places where you push it a little bit further, you kind of get your pencil and kind of put it in there. Here and here, you've got the sense like, ooh, it's really deep forest in there. We talked a little bit about rocks. And so I've got some vertical strokes in here, keeping it simple, especially because this is in the background. I don't want to drop a whole bunch of detail and cracks and all that sort of business in here. If I put a lot of detail into the background, it's going to pull that into the foreground. I want this Lembert dome to recede back here. Anybody recognize it as Lembert dome? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. All right. Um, so I want Lembert dome to be receding back there. If I put dark lines and detail and cracks in here, it's going to pull it forward. You see detail and dark lines as things that are close to us. So that helps it, it sort of drop into the background. And it's hard on something as cool as Lambert Dome to restrain yourself. Like, you know, you know there are like a few little places that there are little trees up there. But if I get in there and mark all those little things in, all of a sudden this is going to become busy and it will start to pop into the foreground. So to keep a sense of depth, I kept it simple. Here coming into the foreground, just a couple of things to notice. I want the water to appear as a flat surface. So any marks that I have in the water, I'm putting those in as horizontal <coughs> lines. Um, notice what I'm doing here, coming around these little clumps of vegetation on the far shore here. It's that same grassland trick which we looked at earlier. So I'm, create, I'm thinking of creating the top edge of this one here with the downstrokes of the part that are behind it. Mm -hmm. And same thing coming in here. Um, a little bit of shadow coming up onto these trees here. Um, and there you've got a Tuolumne Meadows pencil sketch. So it's using those same principles. I can quickly get an area of forest that feels like a lot of forest, but I don't have to draw a lot of trees. Just a little bit of jaggedy on this edge, and that feels like trees back there. If I get in there and I start drawing in a whole bunch of trees, that's going to flatten that out. Um, just to, as a uh, sort of enticement to try to and get you to come over to the dark side of watercolor. Um, <laughs> if you do the, a, a sketch like this, you could put your watercolor directly on top of this. You could just put a wash of green across mm -hmm. here, one color, and your trees are done. They're already shaded by your pencil. Mm -hmm. All right, so hey, let's do that. Um, so here I put a wash of blue in back here. This I put a wash of blue in here, and while it was still wet, I put in some horizontal streaks of brown and green back here and brought some warm orange into this foreground here to be those rocks that as, 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 as things get closer to you in the water on the close bank, you'll see warm colors in there. We think water is blue. But in, when you're seeing that part that is close to you, you get a lot of warm colors that will actually come out there in the water. I'm now going to drop a little bit of watercolor here onto the grasses. And it's all one color getting a little bit sort of more diluted in my brush back there. And then I drop a little bit of purple on top of that, strengthening some of those shadow areas. You can see in here that it actually is purple. So it kind of gets me out of the idea that, you know, grass is green. It's fun to put, get away with putting purple in the grass. <laughs> um, and I probably should have kept that grass just as like that, but I then hit that with a coat of brown on top of it, kind of killed it. But, you know, that's the problem, you know, you, you don't know that you shouldn't have done something until you <laughs> did it, right? So there you have it. Um, now let's just put a coat of green across the trees. All right, so I'm going to mix up one color of green, put it across those trees. So that's not 
shading with watercolor. It's just one color of green back there, diluting it with a little bit more purple to make it more brownish, and lightly putting that in the back of it. Right? And you get the sense that you've done a lot more. But really, I'm just dropping that. So my, like some people are, I don't know, they're, they're amazing with their watercolor stuff. They're like, you know, they say, I don't do this multimedia stuff. I like to open with watercolor. And they'll be up there, and they'll you know, draw everything <laughs> in with their little brush. And I'm, I'm impressed by that. For me, I like I like draw a picture and make myself a coloring book and color inside the lines, and I'm done. Um, but um, for it, I find it, 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 it's, it's fast, and it's, it's, it's easy. I can wrap my head around how to approach that. Um, we will have more watercolor technique studios. Um, la again, last month was old watercolor technique. We will have more of those sorts of things. Um, if you are, are new to it and feeling scared and you want to make yourself a palette. Um, oh, keep it simple, keep it light. Back here on Lembert Dome. Now dropped in on the wash of color on these foreground trees, getting lighter as we go back here. And that's pretty cool. I could have stopped there, but you know, again with watercolor, you always push it a little bit further and you're gonna go like, I wish I didn't do that. But I'm like scanning this on a regular basis as I'm going along. So here's then what I did with it. I wanted to kind of unify some of these other areas and I kinda like it, but I think I over darkened it. But put a shadow in on this mountain that does a good job of then connect. See how this mountain feels more connected with yeah. this? Yeah. I like that. Let's see here. These are more disjunct. Oh. Right? This unified those a little bit more. This does feel more unified. Put a shadow in, in that tree and a little shadow in everything. Um, so something that I like. So it's just... Um, uh, so this is an example of just dropping some watercolor in on top of that woodland that you make. We've had our uh, little workshop on thinking about rocks. A mountain is just a big piece of rock. But again, if it's really far away, I don't want to get too much into detail. I want to keep it simple back there. But still, what I did show was using those, those same sort of techniques, thinking about the planes that I'm observing on it. Um, was, and, yes? was, was that pencil water soluble? Nope, that's just a regular um, graphite pencil. Well, it's graphite. Okay. Yeah, so that's a regular graphite pencil. Um, and, um, oh, one thing to mention on these rocks here, something that really helps those rocks is those little bit of darkness at the base. You see those little dark wedge going up in there? I like it. Um, so, but again, I'm doing the same things which we, we mentioned earlier, like I'm grounding those rocks. Even though they're far away, I've got a little wedge in there. And that, that really helps it. Are there any questions about coniferous forests? <coughs> so in other workshops, what we're going to do is uh, we'll spend time looking at tricks for skies, time looking at tricks for water, and many moods of water. Um, water that can be rough, oceans, um, waterfalls, um, uh, babbling streams, or still lakes. Uh, all of those... Water will do different sorts of things, and, and uh, we'll explore that in, in other workshops. But we've looked really carefully at sculpting rocks. The big take home, if you take nothing else home today, I would start to think about how I can begin to get planes into my work. That is something that really um, carves things in a different way. The take home from this woodland drawing here is that we're, when we're drawing the forest, we want to draw the forest. And there's a few places like the shapes to some of the tips of these. All right, I'm going to pay attention to. If I get this unified enough, I'll feel like those are shadows in the forest rather than carrots hung from the top of it. And it's a lot of fun. All of this, though, we don't want to get wrapped around the axle about the, oh no, now i got to make a pretty picture. Right? These are, I'm going to be showing you lots of tricks to help you quickly get down a sense for what you're seeing. But don't start to get really focused on the pretty pictures. Because 
if you do, that stops you from observing when you're out there in the field. And I think that the most important thing is to use our journal as a doorway to be more present in our lives, to help us notice the things that we would not have noticed if we weren't stopping and making a sketch. Has anybody ever made a little sketch of the time you were traveling somewhere? Stop there, you sit down on a little bench, you sit down and you make a little sketch. It doesn't matter if it's a pretty picture or not, but that moment is forever lost into the fabric of your memory. Right? So this process of journaling helps you remember. Right? The poet the, Billy Collins says, then all the moments of the past began to line up behind that moment, and all the moments to come assembled in front of it in a long row, giving me reason to believe that this was a moment I had rescued from the millions that rush out of sight into a darkness behind the eyes. So our, our, our brains aren't set up to remember the sublime, beautiful experiences that we experience, that we have. But if we stop and do a little bit of sketching and journal, independent of whether or not you get a pretty picture, that moment becomes one of, one of the ones that you rescue. And you carry in the fabric of your long-term memory. And then you get to be in charge of what's in your long-term memory. Things will automatically get in there if they come with a profound emotional shock. Right? But the sublime does not have direct access to our long-term memory. But by doing something like this, you give it permission to be in there. And something that makes you stronger and more resilient because you're also keeping the fabric of all the beauty that you've experienced. So... Thank you so much for coming today and joining the uh, Bay Area Nature Journal Club. And every month, there's a different topic, a free workshop that we've got here. Um, if you enjoy these workshops, I want to encourage people to, number one, tell a friend. Um, the more that you can uh, make this a community of people that comes and celebrates it, that's great. And the other is, um, if you are able to, I want to encourage people to try to, to support what we're doing here. Um, these programs are um, entirely funded by donations. And there's two ways to make donations. You can um, go to my website, which is johnmuirlaws.com, and there's a place through there on, on the right-hand side of the page. People can make uh, donations that are tax-deductible. So completely tax-deductible donations there. Um, you can also... I didn't bring a hat this time. Um, but um, I will... Uh, this will be the surrogate hat. Um, <laughs> if you would like to, uh, to put some shekels into the hat, I encourage you to do that. Um, but also consider if this is something that you would want to support with a larger donation um, that uh, makes it uh, free and accessible to everybody in the San Francisco Bay Area. Consider if you want to join us at the Palette Making Party. And, I'll, and at the, on the last Sunday of this month, last Sunday of every month, free nature sketching field trip a little bit of techniques and really, really good food, a little bit of natural history, lots of time to draw, paint, and observe and be in nature. Thank you very much. Thank you.